Hello and welcome to The Fix. I'm Michael Walker. I'm Aaron Bastani. And we've got many a story for you today. Too many stories. Four stories. We're not going to tell you what they are yet. We're just going to start with the first story, which is about Carillion, uh, the big company you've never heard of until today. Uh, Carillion is a classic PFI company. That means a company, a private company that the state pays to provide public services, including building giant infrastructure projects. So this was a company that the state had been paying to build hospitals, that it pays to provide school dinners, uh, and that it pays to prison guards, etc., things like that. Um, cleaning, cleaning, catering, and construction. Yeah. So Three C's. Instead of a school employing someone directly, the government will pay Carillion to provide the school dinner. Uh, the left has a standard critique of this kind of business. And the critique normally goes that What's happened here is the private company try and cut costs basically by taking it out on the workers. So they'll attack workers' rights, and that will mean that they can give those school dinners for slightly cheaper than the state would have been able to because they cut union rights and it's the workers who yeah. suffer. The other critique tends to be, uh, which is justified, is that because of close relationships between these particular companies and the government, a company will spend a certain amount of money on building the hospital and they'll get loads more back in the future from the state and the hospital. This is PFI, right? So this is PFI, so you end up with a really cushy deal. But this is the industry they're in. So this is the business model they would have been working P on. PFI is a bit like, imagine you have uh, no money, you have no deposit, and you can get a half a million pound flat as a mortgage and you go, this is amazing, I've just moved into a wonderful big flat. And it turns out actually you have to pay one and a half million for mm -hmm. a half a million pound asset over 40 years. That's a bit like PFI, basically, which means sooner or later, the, the chickens come home to roost. But well, normally the chickens would come home to roost for the government. This time, yep. something different has happened because Carillion, far from making super normal profits, has gone bust. Super normal. Super normal profits. That was a, that was a real Trumpism, super normal. No, that's actually a- I'm a really super normal guy. It's a technical word that Is you it? have in neoclassical economics, yeah. Super normal, okay. Yeah. I thought extraordinary, but that's fine. Normal profit, well, this is for a different, different conversation. <laughs> if you want to know the difference between normal profit and super normal we profit. We need James Butler. <laughs> right. Uh, the reason Carillion has gone out of business is because they took on basically too many different contracts which they couldn't really manage. And they went way over cost. And this company from today no longer exists. It's been completely liquidated, which leaves the government in a difficult position because there are hospitals uh, with no one who's there to finish them. Uh, they were a big uh, contractor in HS2, so there now needs to be different companies to go forward with HS2. But uh, well, we don't know the details, right? There's, gonna be, there's, a, there's literally a COBRA meeting right now, I think, addressing all of this. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that that's the problem it... it yeah, uh, I mean, they might give presents. it a cash infusion to finish extant contracts or something, we don't know, right? Well, they've said there's not much more, there's no more money going, they're not going to save the company, so someone else no. has to take on these different essential services that had been subcontracted out to a private company. Uh, but Michael, what's the big, why is this so different? Why, why is this a story? Why is this a story? Why is this a story? Um, basically because you had a private company that was taking on the provision of essential services, someone's got to provide those essential services. Mm. Also, this company employs 20,000 people in Britain, 43,000 people across the world who are going to be worried about their pensions because this company is a billion pounds in debt and 600 million pounds in a pension deficit. That means the amount it owes to its workers uh, is 600 million pounds more than it has set aside to pay those workers. So the government is going to have to step in and clear up this mess. Uh, you, Aaron, though, mm. have been looking at certain people who have been having quite a good time when it comes to the downfall of Korea. Yeah. Who is this working out in the best interest for? Well, Michael made a very good point, which is that Korea hasn't been bailed out, so to speak. So the losers, we haven't seen a socialising of the losses and a privatising of the gains. Many shareholders in Korea have also lost out pension funds and whatnot. But there are actually some big winners some of which is the senior Carillion management, but actually, more surprisingly perhaps, are hedge funds. So if you uh, see in the Times today, uh, we know that people that, I think we've got, a, we've got we can go to the Times, uh, 200 million pound potentially, it's between 80 and 200 million pounds, uh, that hedge funds have made from the short selling of Carillion shares. Now, they've been doing this for several years, 
They've been short selling Carillion <laughs> shares because they've realized there are problems on the way for several years. And yet the government didn't seem to know. The government was still awarding them contracts. The, the, uh, there were three profit warnings for Carillion over the course of the last year. During that time, the government still awarded £2 billion worth mm -hmm. of public sector contracts. So more than being outraged at, oh, this is uh, emblematic of neoliberalism for profit production, even if you believe in markets, even if you believe in the power of privatisation, clearly the government's been massively negligent. Uh, and the people who've won are uh, people like BlackRock, where, by the way, um, George Osborne last year earned £650,000. I think we, maybe we should have that coming up as well in a second. It's in The Guardian. Uh, do we have that coming up? BlackRock? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I think that probably is that. You know, my eyes are so bad, I have no idea. That was about short selling. Short selling, because... Regardless, anyway, I was saying about uh, George Osborne paid £650,000 last year, uh, and BlackRock are one of the senior players in terms of short selling it. You want to say quickly what short selling is? Well, short selling is when a private, like a hedge fund or a private financial company, bets against a company. So they think the share price for Carillion is going to go down because they've seen some profit warnings or they've seen that they don't think this business model really works. And they bet against the company. So if the share price goes down, they they win. It's basically a complicated thing of borrowing shares and selling them on. But that's the the gist of it. And amid this whole shit sandwich of senior management doing very well, shareholders losing out, workers losing out, uh, end users losing out, taxpayer losing out. Amid all of this, the CEO of Carillion was given a CBE. For businesses to service in 2014, he was on a government board between 2011 and 2016. I think overseeing, what was it? Something to do with um, responsible business. <laughs> it's quite ironic, but also tragic. Responsible business. Um, so this shyster has made plenty of money. Uh, and the people that were short selling uh, the shares on this company have made plenty of money. Perhaps most galling of all is that this gentleman again, Philip Green, it's not the same Philip Green. He's still a parasitical money-grabbing tick, but it's not the same Philip Green. In 2015, he was a signatory uh, of a letter which was co-signed by 100 captains of industry, leaders of business, <laughs> on the front page of The Telegraph, saying that people should vote Tory, and that Labour meant more job losses, less growth, and an economy which didn't work for most people. Well, that... In fact, as precisely what Carillion is, it was led by that man, that liar. And because of his ineptitude and because of the government's negligence, the only people that have won out from today who are drinking champagne in the streets of the city of London are the hedge funds. People that work for Carillion and companies like it, they're worrying about the next paycheck, where they can meet their mortgage payments, where they can feed their kids. That's where Britain is in 2017, and that's why we need to fundamentally transform how we run our economy. Hmm. And how would that transformation take place? What are we replacing companies with Carillion with? Well, I think we're very lucky at Navarra Media. We uh, want to announce the launch of the Paul Mason column today. If you go to navarramedia.com, you can see a great article by Paul on precisely this. And the final couple of paragraphs, you know, he's quite, he's quite kind to markets. He says you don't necessarily need to socialise all this stuff. You don't need a massive... Uh, I would actually disagree with some of that. But he seems to think that a lot of this is down simply to the misalignment of incentives mm -hmm. uh, in the market sector. And the way this is done is that you are effectively incentivizing poor performance from companies like Carillion. And you're incentivizing their management teams, like Mr. Philip Green, CBE, to be very myopic and short term. Yeah. So to put that in super simple terms, yeah. Eva, so one option which you haven't mentioned is just that you bring this all in house. So instead of Nationalise it. Instead of giving contracts to private companies to build the hospital and to give the school dinners out, you bring that into <clears> public <throat> ownership, which in terms of school dinners should definitely happen. I mean, they should, because, yeah. Especially for workers' rights, because it's yeah. much better to work for the school that you work in than to work for a company which is based in a different city and which is uh, committed to trying to undercut your wages. All the outsourcing stuff should be brought back in-house. Yeah, exactly. We agree with that. But in terms of the big infrastructure problem infrastructure projects. One option is to nationalise it. The other is to make sure there's proper transparency so that we don't, the government doesn't give out contracts to businesses who are fundamentally about to go bust because of mismanagement by CEOs whose incentives are misaligned because they can make massive personal gain 
mm. £660,000 a year. Or was it £660 million? I don't know. Anyway, this dude's making loads of money. I think you're getting confused with George Osborne at BlackRock. No, no, no. The, Six, he, the, he was on £650,000. The CEO, the CEO One of his Korean 17 is jobs. still making shed loads of money yeah. until October. And their bonuses were completely inoculated from the performance of the company. Mm -hmm. I mean, only, only politicians and the leaders of these major weirdo conglomerates, Sodexo, Capita, Serco, G4S, nobody knows, you know, G4S, you think they work with prisoners, they lock people up, they work at security guards, and then you find out that they're, they're cleaning the arse of donkeys at the local animal sanctuary. They seem to do everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are often very weird incentives with the management of these companies. Next story. Next story. Well... This is a really, I enjoyed this one so much. Now, you might be uh, thinking, you know, you hear every day, Nick Clegg, Alistair Campbell, Andrew Adonis, the usual suspects, they won't have it. They want a second referendum. They will not accept Brexit and the will of the people as of last, well, actually June 2016 now, isn't it? It's almost uh, 18 months ago. But now we know an interesting man has joined their ranks. One Nigel Farage shocked the world mm. last week when he said he wants a second referendum on Britain leaving the EU. What is for certain is that the Cleggs, the Blairs, the Adonises uh, will never, ever, ever give up. They will go on whinging and whining and moaning all the way through this process. So maybe, just maybe, uh, I'm reaching the point of thinking that we should have a second referendum on, because on, what? on EU membership... The whole thing. Yes, of course. Now, subsequently, Mr Farage said that he'd been uh, misunderstood, that he doesn't think there should be a second referendum, despite using literally that exact word, <laughs> should. <laughs> he was worried that there'll be another referendum. He wants his fellow Brexiteers to be prepared. But he's very clear in that excerpt, right? He's saying there should be a second referendum. Now, go and Google the word should. It will tell you obligation, duty, something which is correct to pursue. So should means that he wants one. Now, why would Nigel Farage want another referendum? What do you think? Well, the mainstream, the mainstream opinion about this is basically that Nigel Farage is feeling a bit down because he doesn't have enough attention anymore. Obviously, right. the, the campaign to leave the EU was what made his career. Now we're leaving. He doesn't really have that much to talk about on TV. He had put a lot of... He had bet a lot, of, he'd bet a lot on the success of Steve Bannon, basically. Uh, he'd been speaking... Uh, at Steve Bannon rallies, and for that, uh, what was the name of the pedo candidate for the Roy Moore? Re Roy Moore, uh, pedo, or anyway, he. I mean, I don't think Roy Moore is going to sue us, but uh, fine. There <coughs> yeah. are certain he dated underage girls and was banned from. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> because of Steve Bannon's fall from grace, he was too Nigel aligned with Farage, the right, the right wing of the Trump project. Nigel I mean, Farage wow. has lost political capital in the United States. He needs something to do in Britain, which means we need another referendum. And people think, yeah. But Aaron, you have a more controversial no, no, and sort I, of deeper explanation. This is actually bigger than uh, Farage's ego. Uh, let's go now to, uh, surprisingly, because Nigel Farage hasn't got much to do <coughs> but be on Twitter. Welcome to my life, Nigel. Uh, go on to, uh, <laughs> let's see a, a video from Nigel's Twitter feed. And I think this begins to help us construct a narrative as to why he's now become a... <coughs> <coughs> so the last thing I've ever wanted is another referendum on this issue. But... I began to realise, since Monday, when I went to meet Mr Barnier, that it's just not as simple as that. Because my pessimism in that meeting with Barnier, realising he's not going to give us a good deal, was of course backed up by the three leading British businessmen who went to see him yesterday. We are not going to be offered a grown-up, rounded trade and services deal. Whatever gets put to Parliament is now, I think, likely to be rejected. Even if there was a majority in Parliament that would have voted for Brexit before the general election in June, now there are actually more Tory rebels who would vote against their government on this than there are Labour MPs who would defy their own side. I, I fear that Parliament will reject any deal, and I fear that... So the last Old Nigel. Well, so he fears a lot of things, and the basis of which is that he doesn't think that we'll get a particularly favourable trade deal. If you again look on Nigel's Twitter feed, I think early last week he met Michel Barnier in Brussels, and he came out of that meeting saying that he was really appalled at no trade deal being on the table. 
Now, leaving the EU can be quite easy. It can be quite simple. Uh, I don't want to trigger anybody here. I don't want to upset anybody here, but it could be. But we would have to stay in the single market. There are plenty of people in the single market in the European economic area or the European free trade area like Switzerland, like Norway, all these countries that Farage was saying we could be just like. We could do that. But then we wouldn't be able to set our own um, trade deals. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be able to wheel and deal in the world. And we wouldn't be able to have migration caps, which, let's be honest, is what Farage and many people who voted for Brexit, that's what they want. So we can't do that. So what the likes of Farage want instead is a Canadian-style mm -hmm. trade deal with the EU, which means no tariffs uh, and no barriers on trade between Britain and the EU. And let's cut to that video with David Davis. I think we may have it where he talks about a Canada plus, 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 plus deal. If the basic deal, I'm, I'm being very crude about this, but is Canada plus the city or something oh, like Canada that? Canada plus, plus, plus as well, probably. Plus, plus, plus. Would, would be now one way of putting it. But the it's, plus, but, plus, but the plus is a difficult, aren't they? Because, for instance, the French want to steal as much of the city as they possibly can. So the fact that they can... I wouldn't it, use it, that word. That's your word. That's my word. Yeah. It's pos if Canada plus, 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 plus. So uh, there's, a, there's a bit of an issue here because what they want is they want a Canada-style deal. No tariffs, no barriers. Canada squared. <laughs> Canada to the power of 15. <laughs> but they want basically tariff-free access to the European market, but they also want passporting rights for the city, but they also want to set migration caps, but they also want to have uh, independent uh, trade policy with the rest of the world. Now, you can't have all of this. Mm. And so what Farage, and bear in mind, Nigel Farage, his only job outside of politics is working as a commodities trader in the city of London. His concern is that we could have a Canada-style deal, again, very doable, but London will lose passporting rights. Now, what does that mean? It would mean that London, fundamentally, would be at a distinct advantage to Frankfurt, to Paris, to Dublin, in terms of financial services, more or less. I think it would probably be the end of London as a global financial hub. Now, I think this question should be posed to Nigel Farage. If we leave the EU, but it means that London doesn't have passporting rights and it loses its preeminence as a financial city, would you rather be in or out? And I think Farage is beginning to put his cards on the table. He'd rather be in the EU. So for 20 years, this man has been mouthing off about leaving this club, this kleptocratic, phony, elite, driven organisation. It turns out he never had a fucking plan. It turns out he doesn't know what happens next. And it turns out he has no contingencies if we can't have our cake and eat it. Whether you're Brexit, whether you remain, leave this lying phony where he belongs. And that's in 2016. We're going to go to a break. Great. Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Us. It's about us. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. 40 kids on the roof of Melbourne. <laughs> for all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navarra Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money, and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarra events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarramedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. It wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be a fix if we didn't talk about Donald Trump. Uh, and of course, last week, as you're probably already aware, maybe you heard about this, Michael? Uh, yeah, I did. The Donald referred to a bunch of countries as shithole countries. Uh, he was referring to primarily to countries who now send lots of immigrants to, immigrants rather, to the US. This was in a bipartisan meeting, including Democrats. Uh, and reports have said that Trump said during that meeting, 
Why are we having all, and I quote, why are we having all these people from these shithole countries come here? Uh, and he followed by saying, why don't we have more people coming from countries like Norway? Um, accounts suggest that when Mr. Trump was told that the largest group of immigrants with the status they were discussing, which is um, temporary protected status, he was told they were primarily from El Salvador, from Honduras, and from Haiti. The president responded, Haitians? Do we need more Haitians? Oof. Do we need more Haiti Haitians? Wow. So, um, yeah, this was a bit strange, and it kicked off a, a strange debate around a president that would have the temerity to use the word shithole in office. Mm. What do you think, Michael? Um, well, I mean, obviously, it's, it's completely outrageous, and obviously the difference between Norway and the countries he's talking about is the race of the people that come from them. Uh, in terms of the practical import of what he's saying, I mean, it is standard conservative discourse that conservatives tend to want people from certain countries countries for certain unsaid reasons. I mean, even in the EU debate, there was a lot of talk of, why don't we get more people from Australia and America and less people from Eastern Europe? Uh, so I do think that... This or even within the European thing, they'll say French and German doctors. They don't say yeah. the Romanian baristas. Who implicit. Have just, who have just as much right to be here under the current framework, right? Yeah, implicit in a lot of what Farage says is we've got no problems with Australians and French or yeah. Romanians. I say implicit, so don't sue me. I mean, at this point, I'm pretty sure he probably has explicitly said it. Yeah, he probably has said it um, explicitly. What do you think? I think that, and this may, people think maybe I'm being, you know, rude. I think Donald Trump maybe has early stage uh, dementia. Mm. Uh, because having seen people like this, the occasional outbursts, the sort of the speech patterns he has, I think it's possible. And I'm saying this for a couple of reasons. We now know that Ronald Reagan, as early as 1984, was suffering from dementia. His son was on record as saying that uh, from as early as 1984. You know what uranium is, right? It's a thing called nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of things are done well, known with that he uranium. had dementia, but it was only documented from the early 1990s. And then furthermore, uh, we know that uh, as people live longer, Dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, and I'm sorry for the team here, I've actually moved around things a little bit. Dementia <laughs> and Alzheimer's are becoming more of a health risk. It's now the leading killer in uh, England and Wales. I think it's sixth in the United States. So in the early 20th century, most people died from pneumonia, bronchitis, infection, tuberculosis, diphtheria. Okay? Today it's cancer, heart disease. Hopefully, as our healthcare gets even better, which it won't, by the way, under neoliberalism, but if we win, it will do more and more people will be suffering and dying from dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay? So this is a very real topic because more and more people will have it. But I think in the case of Trump in particular, this is an issue because the president has the nuclear codes, they have huge mm. gender setting powers. If you actually watch what he's saying, I mean, it's, it's a different guy to the, the man we even saw 10, 15 years ago. There's a few examples I've pulled up and we're going to go to them now. Does this seem to you like a man who's in full control of his faculties? You know what uranium is, right? It's a thing called nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of things are done with uranium, including some bad things. My uncle was a great you know, professor and scientist and engineer, Dr. John Trump at MIT. Good, good genes, very good genes, okay? Very smart. The Wharton School of Finance, very good, very smart. You know, if you're a conservative Republican, if I were a liberal, if, like, okay, if I ran as a liberal Democrat, they would say I'm one of the smartest people anywhere in the world. It's true. But when you're a conservative Republican, they try, oh, do they do a number? That's why I always start off, went to Wharton, was a good student. Went there, went there, did this, built the, you know, I have to give my like, credentials all the time. My uncle. Yes, there's this thing. I mean, you're, you're into this, I know this. That like, he has the sort of register of a fourth grader mm. and that makes him the arch populist. Uh, well, except the people in the background look quite worried there. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that went too far. If you go to YouTube and you put Donald Trump 1980, 1990, 1995, he's actually, I mean, people might disagree with this. He's, I think he's quite an articulate, eloquent person who still has a populist register. Mm -hmm. But he can't form full sentences here. For a very long time, he's been a white supremacist, but now he's a white supremacist who seems to have less relationship to reality. Yeah. And he, but just the way he talks seems to be changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he's just had this medical, I think, two days ago. Yeah, but it's entirely sort of arbitrary, you know. It, the, the, the only details that are released are at the behest of the president. 
Uh, so we don't know on mm -hmm. a bunch of things what's going on. And like I say, look, Reagan had Alzheimer's in the final years of the Cold War. Imagine if Trump had something similar whilst he was trying to take on the evil empire of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It is a worry because, the, like I say, so much American foreign policy and its competences, especially nuclear weapons, are concentrated in the, in the powers of one man. Mm. And it's concerning. I mean, it is a big worry, especially with the nuclear button. I think one conclusion, though, is it's, it ultimately doesn't matter whether he does or whether he doesn't. Because to get rid of... This is, this is being discussed a lot in America at the moment, especially yeah. because of the book by Michael Wolff. I think with good which reason. Which made him sound, yeah, off the chain. Uh, but to get rid of someone on the grounds of not being fit for office, mm. uh, you need at least a majority of the cabinet of the people he's appointed. Mm. You need a majority of both houses of, of Congress. I mean, mm. it's, it's not going to happen. Mm. And I think what's relevant here as well is that he hasn't deteriorated since he was elected. So he has a democratic mandate yeah. as someone who speaks and acts like this. So I don't know how far that diagnosis I mean, I, would get us. I want to be clear. I'm not trying to stigmatise this stuff. Uh, it's going to happen to more and more people. In fact, my genome, apparently I'm quite disposed to getting Alzheimer's as they mm. get older. But it, it, it's a consideration. People are living longer. Uh, and if we're going to have more and, you know, more and more people in public office in older age, which is going to happen because all of society is aging. Okay? In, 19, I think in 1916, if you were born, you had a 1 in 100 chance of reaching 100 years old. Today, you have a 1 in 3 chance of reaching 100 years old. So, yeah, we've got this thing up here about Alzheimer's in the US. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the US. It's going up all the time. So I'm not trying to stigmatise it. This is a genuine issue. And actually, I think with Trump, look at him over time, and I mm. think it's kind of pretty obvious what's going on. There's many things going on, but I think that probably is one of them. I think it's a, yeah, it's We're going to end on good news. Go. Which is... A rarity. Rarity. Oh, we get quite a lot of oh, we do news get a lot of here, news. don't we? Uh, this is the NEC elections. The left slate, the momentum slate, has won. Uh, Yasmin Dar, John Landsman, and Rachel Garnham will enter the NEC tomorrow. Uh, hopefully to democratise the party. Uh, this wasn't met by joy from all quarters of British society, especially the British establishment. So I think we're going to get up the evening standard headline. Corbyn's is, Red Army's takeover. Is takeover complete. Yeah. Uh, this is bizarre on a number well, of levels. But obviously George Osborne can't have the headline... I was the Chancellor when batshit Carillion was given loads of government contracts, when mm -hmm. even hedge funds were shorting it. Yeah. You can't have that as the front page, right? But it's also not just a distraction. I think this is going to become increasingly a dominant media narrative. One that Labour are revolutionaries and extremists when we really just want to reverse privatisation, fund the NHS pro properly and do it by taxing the rich, or very reasonable, moderate demands. In the context of neoliberalism, though, revolutionary. Yeah. This is, our, this is our problem. Bernie Sanders style revolution. Yeah. Not 1917 style revolution. Preferably not. Preferably not. Preferably not. I'd rather have central heating rather than, you know. <coughs> oh, I agree. Preferably not. Yeah. Be involved in some you know, um, shenanigans like that. But more importantly than that, we are going to see more and more uh, the establishment press try and give the impression that Labour Party is being overtaken by a doctrinaire bunch of people who are instilling discipline in basically Soviet Leninist fashion. Touchwood? No, uh, I'm joking. Well, to some degree, touch wood, uh, <laughs> because uh, this is exactly what hasn't happened in the Labour Party. The left don't have total control, which is what Kevin Schofield said today. 172 MPs voted against Labour members to get rid of Corbyn <laughs> in 2016. 172. They're still all there. They're still the majority of the PLP. Well, members. they're not all there. I Most mean, of them will be right. Five or six have sort of like resigned at the last election, but no one's been deselected. No one's been disciplined. Penis, 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 or John Woodcock, as I like to call mm. him. That's his real name, actually, John Woodcock. Uh, he's still there. I mean, he's he's gonna go, he, he he's the only one I really want to go now. So we've lost Tristram Hunt, we've lost two else, we lost we lost quite a few. Well, what John Woodcock said, Jamie Reed. before the last general election was that if Labour win, if Labour get the most votes and the most seats, yeah. he will block Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister. Yeah. In a party where the left had total control, would that man still have a job? Absolutely not. He's an idiot. Absolutely he's not. An, like, John Woodcock is an un. Alloyed mm. idiots. Uh, Simon Dankshuk's gone. A lot of bad people have gone. You know, we have there's lots of reasons to be happy. There are lots of reasons to be happy, but the party has not been nearly democratized no. enough. And what we will see over and over again is that the centrist MPs, their biggest defense against democratization, 
or the biggest block they'll pose to democratisation is their friends in the mainstream media who they say, if you pass any reforms which threaten our jobs for life, we're going to go and give a lot of quotes to the Evening Standard saying that the Labour Party has become a revolutionary party uh, which is completely unwelcoming of anyone who doesn't want X, Y, Z. Well, you know how many, I mean, so we've got these. It was, it was Yasmin, John Lansman, and who was the third candidate? Rachel Garnham. Rachel Garnham. They all got in excess of 60,000 votes. Mm -hmm. I think Yasmin got 67,000. John Lansman got 65,000. Guess how many members the Conservative Party has, the whole party. It has about 70,000. So, well, slightly under, maybe, right? So, more or less, mm -hmm. John Lansman might have won more votes than there are members of the Conservative Party. So, to frame this as... Uh, a kind of uh, a hostile takeover by a small number of people. I mean, it literally couldn't be further from the truth. This is a mass membership organisation, actually, which has never seen these levels in modern history of such level, you know, such high participation. So, but that's why, you know, when... And the membership is still massively underrepresented yeah. in every part of the party, but, including the NEC. But that's why when Progress MPs or whatever go to complain about this on BBC Daily Politics, BBC Daily Politics aren't saying, well... Why are you saying this? Well, it's because you want a job for life. Mm -hmm. You know, the establishment fits into a number of places, media, politics, and so on, and they all want to inoculate politics more generally from this idea that ordinary people can get involved and can change the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've gone one step towards a de democrat, one more step towards a democratic Labour Party, one more step between bursting that bubble mm. in Westminster that tries to keep ordinary people out. So well done, John. Well done, Rachel, and well done, Yasmin. I think that's all for us today. It is. We've got a Tisky Sour coming this week, I believe. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. We'll work that out. We'll work it out. Uh, see you next week on the See you next Monday.